Okay. Um, we'll continue this morning on uh, the seven churches of Revelation, the letters that were written. Um, today we're on Pergamon. Uh, if you want to turn to it, it's Revelation chapter 2, verse 12 to 17. We'll read that in just a little second. And if you remember, when we look at the seven churches uh, in Revelation, which the book of Revelation was written to, uh, Jesus' words, and uh, we need to look at that and see that how that is relevant for us in our lives today. And it's interesting whenever you go through the seven churches, and as we'll go through them over the coming months, how we can see ourselves within it, and really that's just an extension of that teaching this morning. So I'm just going to read a few verses from <laughs> Revelation chapter two to the church or to the angel of the church in Pergamon write, These are the words of him who has the sharp double-edged sword. I know where you live, where Satan has his throne. Yet you remain true to my name. You did not renounce your faith in me, not even in the days of Antipas, but my faithful witness who was put to death in your city, where Satan lives. Verse 14, Nevertheless, I have a few things against you. There are some among you who hold to the teaching of Balaam, who taught Balak to entice the Israelites to sin so that they ate food sacrificed to idols and committed sexual immorality. Likewise, you also have those who hold to the teaching of the Nicolaitans. Repent, therefore, otherwise I will soon come to you and will fight against them with the sword of my mouth. Whoever, is hears, whoever has ears, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To the one who is victorious, I will give some of the hidden manna. I will also give that person a white stone with a new name written on it, known only to the one who receives it. It's interesting that whenever we read through these seven churches, generally speaking, there's a commendation and a condemnation for each of the seven churches. Although uh, last time I was here, I pointed out that a couple of the churches, there is no condemnation for them. But however, there are five out of the seven that do. And there's commendations there as well. And the point is that very often we can be good at one thing and maybe not so good at another thing. And that's really part of what is going on here. But there was a condemnation and a commendation uh, both for the church in Pergamon. Um, the city of Pergamon uh, was located north of Ephesus and Smyrna and about 15 miles from the Aegean Sea. It was uh, very near the modern city of Bergama. Uh, which is in Turkey today. It is estimated that, that at that time, the time that the letter was written here, it had a population of about 160,000, which was a fairly substantial population for a city at that time. It was the cultural, religious and intellectual centre of the region, with a university that had a library of uh, about 200,000 handwritten volumes, no typewriters, no word processors, uh, back then, but 200,000 handwritten volumes in this university library. And there were four major pagan temples located in Pergamon at, the, at that time. It's, some of these gods you will have heard of, I have no doubt. The first one was Athena, uh, the goddess of wisdom and the arts. Do you ever remember there was an art shop in Belfast called Athena? For those of us who are old enough, who have visited Belfast uh, at times, maybe 30 years ago, there was an art shop called Athena. Well, that was after the uh, goddess of wisdom and the arts. Um, there was another goddess there called, uh, As, forgive me for my pronunciation, Asclepius, let's go for that, might be wrong, uh, but it's the god of medicine, and you'll be familiar with this as well, it's a serpent on a staff, so if you can think even of uh, our ambulance service logo, there'll be, or health sector there's a serpent on a staff that's actually after a greek god uh, aclepius uh, which is the god of medicine then there is the god of uh, the Di dionysus i'm really struggling with these today uh, which was the god of wine and fertility where we get orgy from and then another one that i'm sure you're all familiar with was zeus uh, zeus the ruler of the heavens and the father of the gods who was the father of the gods? Will we name that person Satan, potentially? Mm -hmm. It's interesting that verse 13 tells us that this was the home of Satan. Very, very interesting, actually, phrase. 
and we will come back to that a little bit that that at that time jesus is telling us is that that's where satan lived he lived in pergamon and uh, we'll come back to that uh, and pergamon was a center for emperor worship so a lot of the laws that were written at that time uh, that were passed in the whole of asia minor that large subcontinent area the laws were passed through pergamon and it was full of emperor worship as well very evil place remember whenever we were looking uh the last time at smyrna we were looking at ephesus the whole region was terribly evil but never see that that it's on like where we are today because it may be a different type of evil it's not really but on the surface we may think of it as that but this world is an evil place and we will get back to that uh, verse 12 then starts by jesus saying to the angel or to the leader of the church in pergamum right these are the way, the words of him who has the sharp double-edged sword jesus introduces himself to each of the churches in a slightly different way and this time he's saying look i am the sharp double-edged sword now we know from scripture elsewhere in scripture what the double-edged sword is the double-edged sword is actually the word of god who is jesus and we know that and we know that from john chapter 1 uh, hebrews 4 12 and 13 we can see clearly that for the word of god the word of god is alive and active it is sharper than any double-edged sword it penetrates to the dividing of soul and spirit joints and marrow it judges this is the important bit it judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart nothing in all creation is hidden from god's sight everything is uncovered and laid bare before the eyes of him to whom we must give an account and again i think we often pass over references like this in scripture and very often even if we've been around church for decades we miss some of the stuff that is in there because in our human mind we create what i refer to as a tick box culture we refer to things that we should or shouldn't do but it's the hidden things it's the things that goes on in our thought process it's the things that goes on in our attitudes and our cultural mindsets that is wrong very wrong at times not always wrong but very wrong often and so jesus is really telling the church in pergamon here right at the very start he says look i know everything that you do now i know that we all know that but it's the reality of really getting that from our head to our hearts and the complete understanding of the fact that God knows and Jesus knows everything about us. And there's nothing that you can do that is going to shock God. Because God already knows. And there's nothing that you will confess to him that he obviously does not already know. Although that's how we think. That's how our minds sort of work. But God knows our hearts. God knows our thoughts. And we will have to give an account of our actions someday to the one who can divide that soul and spirit and god will judge us and the fact is as well and i've already been covering some of these things in recent months anyway is that each and every one of us will stand before god we will go to that bema seat of christ if you're a believer you still will have to give an account for the words or uh, that you used or the omission of words the things that maybe you didn't say whenever we should have said and, and we're all in that place and it's a really interesting concept that doesn't really get taught on too much these days this whole idea of standing at the judgment seat of christ giving an account of what we did or didn't do and the fact that that will bring rewards in some way for our future life in heaven and jesus knows everything that we do you know i was reading in my, in my, my readings this morning i was reading that very dark chapter that david was in king david was involved in and where he made it very great error of judgment and he had relations with Bathsheba and then as a result of that he became a murderer and a liar and, and you sort of think okay that's not something that I would do you might think that but actually there is so much in our hearts the whenever Jesus is teaching on the Sermon on the Mount as to whether we actually do it or not if we if we hate our brother we're guilty of murder if we're lustful in our hearts were guilty of adultery the thing the point is that david found himself in that very dark place but yet david responded from that that's the point and david 
brought that before God and is referred to twice in scripture as a man after God's own heart. And whenever I was reading that this morning, I just thought, you know what? Yes, every last one of us, we have stuff going on or has went on, but we just have to lay it down at the altar each and every day and say, yes, I know that I have not, I've got that wrong in some way or I've took a wrong turn or whatever the case might be or my thoughts haven't been, haven't been proper or appropriate or I've got anger or envy against someone or I'm jealous about a circumstance or whatever it happens to be. The fact is that we need to turn our back on those things and we need to lay them down at the feet of Jesus. Every living day we must get up and we must give an account of what it is and how it is that we live. And you know, the more I pray about these things, and I, as you know, I, I feel that God has been really talking to me over the last two years about some of the things that I've been teaching on. And the more I think about my life and God, and the more I think about the church's life and God, and I'm going to say an obvious thing here, but it's just, it's a realization almost of this, is that the more that I think about those things, the more that I realize that life is really, really not about my comfort. Life is really not about what I get from God. Life, that's just a, a nice byproduct sometimes, but life is not about that. Life for us in these 70, 80, 90 years, whatever it is God gives us here on this earth, is not about us in any way. And yes, life goes on, of course it does, and we have to make decisions, we have to do stuff. I'm not saying that we don't, but I genuinely believe that we're coming very rapidly in, the, in terms of the world here to some sort of a crossroads. I believe it with all my heart. And I tend not to teach like this and haven't never done. I've been teaching for a number of years. It's only been the last year that God is really starting to impress this in my life. Is, and I don't think it takes a genius to work out that the world's in an absolute meltdown at the minute. Nearly every government in the world has mega problems, including our own. Well, in fact, our own, we don't even have one. That's how desperate our problems are. But the UK, the Europe, the United States, you just look at all of that. And I'm not having to go at the leaders because we need to support our Christian leaders. And thank God we have some of those in leadership. But the point, and I've gone off on a bit of a tangent here, I suppose, in the introduction. But the idea is that we really need to recognize what it is that we're here for. And the church will have to make a decision. The church will have to come off the fence. The church will absolutely have to decide what side it's on. And I'm not going to get into the theology of where we stand whenever we stand before God because we could teach all day and that kind of thing. But I'm saying genuinely what should motivate us as believers in this life is not about our personal comfort, but what should motivate us is for the short number of decades that we may have here compared to what the all of eternity is going to be. We really should get into the Word of God because the Word of God and the Spirit of God is everything. There's nothing beyond that. And so what was the commendation then for this church in Pergamon? Verse 13 tells us, I know where you live, where Satan has his throne. Yet you remain true to my name. You did not renounce your faith in me, not even in the days of Antipas, my faithful witness, who was put to death in your city, where Satan lives. Really, really interesting phrase there. Genuinely, because you think of Satan, and Satan being that, evil spiritual being but jesus is telling us that at that time two thousand years ago that's where satan felt comfortable that's where he set up home now i'm not going to get into the realms of where satan might be living today we know that scripture tells us that he roams the world trying to seek devour destroy and do whatever he can we know from scripture that that's exactly how he gets on and he lives in that spiritual heavenly realm where the uh where, the, where the, I suppose where, where, where spiritual warfare goes on. But the idea that Jesus is clearly pointing out is that this place where you live, Pergamon, is so evil that Satan has set up home there. And as a result of that, Antipas, my faithful witness, has been sacrificed, has been put to death in your city because of it. Now, Antipas was the bishop of Pergamon. And Antipas was a good guy. And it's not just Antipas that has lost his life here, but Antipas was that sort of leader of the city who'd stood up against the emperor and the worship of the emperor and basically refused to renounce his faith. And as a result, he was murdered in the most horrific way. And I'll not go into that. 
Uh, you can look that up for yourself on Google just because there's some younger ones here. But he was martyred in a, in a horrific way because of his faith in God. And Jesus is saying clearly that Antipas remained faithful to me regardless. doesn't matter what was going to happen to him as that leader, I suppose, one of the leaders in the church of Pergamon. And the believers in Pergamon remained true to the name of Jesus, remained true to the difficulties that they were facing. They still remain true to their faith in God. And Jesus is commending them for not renouncing their faith in the face of very difficult things in a city that was con completely controlled by Satan. Sin abounds all around them. Some have lost their lives other than Antipas as well because they refuse to renounce their faith in God. We know that that happens regularly today in this world that we live in. If you think back to, uh, I think it was one of the massacres in America, the Columbine. You maybe heard that phrase, Columbine massacre. We're talking a long, long, long time ago. But I remember reading at the time that there was a young girl died in that massacre because the two shooters had asked her to renounce her faith in Jesus and she wouldn't do it. And they shot her because of it. And that was in American soil. That, that wasn't in maybe the countries that we, we would expect that to be in. Now, I know that's not a, maybe a common thing in the West today. But it certainly is a common thing in, uh, I think they call it the 1040 window, somewhere like that. that. That sort of area of the world that has this type of thing going on regularly. But what about the persecution that may not necessarily be that peace where we lose our life or where are we going as a church in the future that's the thing as well and if you look if you if you study this subject of persecution our mindsets in the west we haven't quite caught up with the people who are being persecuted in this because if you read about this or you talk to people who maybe have been participants in this if they they don't necessarily want to get away from that persecution the West, we might pray for our brothers and sisters and pray that they won't, will get away from persecution, but they, the individuals who are involved in it recognize themselves that it's actually what their faith is about. It is what their Christ-like character is growing upon. And very often they don't pray for the persecution to, to leave them because they recognize the process that is going on. But we should remember our brothers and sisters absolutely because of, if we hurt they should hurt and if they hurt that we should hurt because we're all family we're all going to spend eternity together and it is true today this very day probably within this next 24 hours that people will lose their lives who refuse to renounce their faith in Jesus Christ and I suppose we shouldn't forget the fact that that potentially could be something that we may face in our lifetimes and I, I don't know if that is that fact or not but it is possible However, in that very strong position that the church is in, and you would suggest just that that was very good, that people didn't succumb to renouncing their faith in Jesus Christ and they were commended for it. But Jesus goes on to say, look, I'm condemning you for this, however. And whenever I thought about that and I thought, well, do you know what? Yes, it's sometimes easy for us as believers to stand up for our faith and not renounce Jesus and say, yeah, we're Christians. But what about all of the stuff that's going on behind the scenes? And that's what Jesus is about to point out here in Pergamon. He's saying, yes, you've stood up like Antipas and you haven't renounced me. But what about all of this other stuff that's going on? And that's the challenge for us today. And there's a very similar theme here to the church in Ephesus that we talked about two months ago about some of the things that they were involved in. And so the condemnation then, Jesus says in verses 14, and he says, nevertheless, I have a few things against you there are some among you who hold to the teaching of Balaam who taught Balak to entice the Israelites to sin so that they ate food sacrificed to animal or sorry idols and committed sexual immorality and likewise you also have those who hold to the teaching of the Nicolaitans they will get back to the Nicolaitans in a wee minute or two but that was one of the things that was pointed out to the church in Ephesus and so do you remember the story of Balaam or Balaam and Balak in Numbers 22, 23, 24, 25. That's the reference in scripture where a donkey spoke. And, and we often sort of comment on that. But that's whenever the donkey spoke to the false prophet to tell him what was going on, really, interestingly. And whenever I think about the likes of Balaam, who was an evil guy, it was interesting to note that he's referred to as a prophet. And I can't quite get my head around some of the things that are in Old Testament scripture 
we can study and we can try, but Balaam wasn't a good guy. And Balak certainly wasn't a good guy. And Balak was the king of Moab. And he was afraid that the Israelites would attack and kill all of them. And so he sent for Balaam, the prophet, to place a curse on the Israelites so that they, the Israelites could be defeated. But God told Balaam not to curse them, but to say the words of blessing that he would give him. And there were something like seven blessings, something like that, that Balaam actually spoke over. The Israelites was blessing instead of cursing. But since Balaam could not, and this is the interesting bit here, but since Balaam could not curse the Israelites, he taught Balak how to entice them to sin. Okay, so he couldn't do what he was asked to do, but he was able to do something else. The subliminal piece, which we can all get caught up in. And the subliminal piece was really that he sent for Balaam the prophet to curse, sorry, but instead of that, he taught them how to entice them. He taught them how to actually grip them in a different way. And part of that was about food to, to idols and, and sexual immorality. And so the, the Moabite women then, they enticed the men of Israel. Enticed the men of Israel to commit immoral sexual acts and to make sacrifices to their gods. And the idea was that if the devil wasn't able to outwardly defeat something, he was able to inwardly infiltrate them. And he tore down their moral fiber and their moral foundation. Now this is really, really important. And very often we look at Old Testament and we think, ah, oh, come on, that's just a story. But in Old Testament reality, something that actually happens in Old Testament times, we have to see that as a New Testament truth. And we have to see it in a sense that it may not be exactly relevant that we're going to actually lift a piece of meat for, that's been left before an idol. It's what the truth of that and the symbolism of that means. And the sexual immorality is not just a complete and utter reference to sec sexual things, but it can be that uh, fornication with the things of evil. But yes, it's also about thought processes and mindsets as well. But it's amazing that God told Moses to kill all the leaders who had joined in the worship of Baal. And 24,000 people died as a result of the idolatry, the fornication and the compromise. So therefore the teaching of Balaam that's being talked about here in this verse and in this condemnation to the church in Pergamon, the doctrine of Balaam was actually the lowering of the standard of separation that God expects from his people and a compromise with the world. Now whenever I was thinking about that, and again genuinely just, you know, I try never to teach from a condemnatory way because I know that all of these fingers are pointing backwards. And whenever we study scripture, we have got to look and see, right, God, what exactly is it that you're saying at the time? What it's 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 the word for it is hermeneutics. It what do the words in the page mean? What was being written to the church in Pergamon, and what should we take from that to apply to our lives today? And that's how we should read scripture. So whenever we're looking at that and thinking, right, is there a moral compromise? Is there a breakdown of the very fabric of society? And I'm going to say, and I'm not going to be probably giving you anything that surprises any of you here. Yes. Has that affected the church? Absolutely. Now, I actually think that we've moved on positively in some ways over the last 30, 40 years. I know that whenever I was first being brought up in the church, there was stuff in there that really was traditional and religious that just was inappropriate. And I'm not having to go with anybody because we thought that it was potentially right at the time. And so I'm definitely not having to go with anybody. But I'm telling you also that what the fact that that's good, that we've got away from some of the religious stuff, we've actually opened up the door to stuff that is actually breaking down our moral fiber. And it's actually compromising us in so, so many ways. And I don't need to tell you about some of the things that potentially we tolerate now that we didn't used to. And I also think that that's a very dangerous place to be, but it's how the devil has actually infiltrated it's actually the devil, how, and he is clever. Don't ever underestimate the devil. But he's clever in the sense that it's the idea that if he can't attack us from without, if we've got this big shield going on, if he can get into the very moral fiber and DNA of the church and changes to compromise in so many different ways, then actually he's starting to win. And he's starting to win the hearts and minds of the people that attend church. And it might sound like, I don't know, I, I hope I don't sound like a broken record every month that I come here, but it's actually such an important thing for us to understand that we need 
to realize what is happening in this world that we live in. Our principles and our morals are being attacked every day in this country. Will it be our downfall? There is so much happening now, and I, I discuss things with people from time to time, and it's amazing how much we start to tolerate now. It's amazing how we take a step back from some of the very obvious things that we as church should be standing up against. And I'm telling you right now, we will have to make a decision. And we'll have to make a decision very soon because we're compromising, generally speaking, we're compromising far too much. The church was also condemned for some holding to the teaching of the Nicolaitans. And I taught on this whenever I spoke about the Ephesians. The Nicolaitans were a sect of Gnostics. Gnostic meaning knowledge was power. And it's, uh, there's a lots of actually stuff written in scripture about Gnosticism. And the, the epistles to John, for example, starts off by talking about challenging those Gnostics who had set themselves up as a religious sect where knowledge was the thing that actually saved as far as they were concerned. And the idea of spirit is spirit and flesh is flesh. So it doesn't matter how we live in the flesh. Flesh didn't matter because it was the spirit that actually responded to the things of God. So if we were saved in spirit didn't matter what happened over here and again can i challenge us in church today is it possible that people actually think you know what i'm saved there's something going on in the spiritual aspect of my life so it doesn't really matter how i live over here doesn't really matter what the flesh is like doesn't really matter what i sit and listen to doesn't really matter what i watch on television doesn't really matter how i talk about other people doesn't really matter about the arguments and the fights and the language that i use none of that really matters but I'm telling you, that's exactly what was going on in Scripture. That's exactly what was going on in these churches. That was exactly what was being taught by the Nicolaitans. That was exactly what Balaam's doctrine was about actually that compromise in, world, in, in the world and that complete breakdown of the moral fibre and the fact that, do you know what, it doesn't really matter. Do you know what, here's my opinion. And it's amazing how many Christians say, here's my opinion on something but they actually rarely go to scripture and see what actually is God saying about it and you know I was sort of thinking as well and I'm sorry for taking tangents but you'll forgive me for that but sometimes whenever I think about these things and I think that we often think about reaching this world and we have a marketing strategy but it's amazing how actually if we can carry, and I keep going on about this and I don't apologise for it, but if we can carry the Holy Spirit of God out into that world, God himself can do everything that we can't. We don't have to dress God up in any way. We don't have to have the perfect opening sentence ever. If we carry God, the most awkward of people will show the world who God is if we carry God. If we are vessels of the Holy Spirit, then the Holy Spirit is the one who reaches the world. Would you agree with that? But it's amazing how actually we concentrate on how we need to do things. And we forget about all the stuff that's going on behind the scenes. We forget about actually what it is that we should be and how we should be living. Because if we can concentrate on that piece, then we'll actually carry the Holy Spirit. And then the rest of it actually is really easy. All we have to do is go. Because the Holy Spirit will do. The Holy Spirit will bring people to that, to their knees before him. In conviction of their sins. But we've got it wrong. We've all this mindset about what it is that we should be saying and doing. And how we should look. And how we should promote things. And our marketing strategy. We've become the best marketers in the world. Churches. Yeah. But if we carry Jesus to the world in the way that we've been called to do, then let's, the Holy Spirit will do the work after that. So the Nicolaitans were this set of Gnostics who had knowledge as power. They taught impure doctrine. They followed impure practices. They were into sexual perversion, fornication, and eating food offered to idols. And they mixed pagan rites with Christian ceremonies. That animals, or sorry, that food sacrifice to animals i touched on it two months ago but i want to just touch on it briefly again because it is so so important in scripture because very often we have the tick box thing going on about the do's and don'ts that's not actually what scripture is entirely about whenever jesus and the other writers in the new testament were teaching and paul clarified this in first corinthians chapter 8 whenever he talked about what it actually meant the actual eating of the meat that was sacrificed to animals was not the issue 
the issue was the fact that we could cause someone to stumble because of what we did and so whenever we're thinking about our do's and don'ts our do's and don'ts should not be about do's and don'ts our do's and don'ts should be about how am i going to represent god and all of what i'm doing because of what i might just about go to now and it's the idea of our younger brother or sister could be offended in such way the minute and point in time that we cause an issue for our brother or sister then we've sinned so the sinning is not the actual eating of the meat the sinning is the fact that we've caused someone else to stumble and we don't tend to think like that as christians and again i know these are challenging words and don't apologize for it but that we miss the point the important point is that actually we represent God in everything that we do. And whenever we cause someone else to have an issue, with that's whenever we've crossed the line. And the idea of mixing pagan rites with Christian ceremonies is something that is prevalent in the world today. Anybody heard of Chrislam? A couple of people? Chrislam started, and again, I'm not going to get into all of the stuff that's going on in the world today. But Chrislam started in Nigeria, believe it or not. Maybe people don't, don't recognize that. Uh, I can't remember the guy who started it, but it basically was tied up with Christianity. It says what it says on the tin. Christianity, Islam, but believe it or not, Gnosticism is in there as well. Those were the three main things that drove Chrislam in the 80s. So we're talking about a number of decades ago. That has now become prevalent in different parts of the world. It's also become prevalent in the United States. And some big names, people who you are well aware of, and I'm not going to name them here today, who are involved in this thing. And I'm not going to have a go at these individuals, but the point that I'm making is that there is only one way to heaven, and that is through Jesus Christ. That you can dress it up whatever way you want. The Bible is clear in that. Now, we all know that. I know that we all know that, but are we entertaining stuff sometimes that is not appropriate, not right? And I'm not having a go at anybody. I promise you I'm not. Because for me, there is a simple test is Jesus Christ the center of what's going on here? You can see it in 1 John 4. Test the spirits because if the spirits are telling you that what people are saying is that Jesus Christ came in the flesh, died for our sins, rose again, and that we can be forgiven to go to heaven, that is all that it takes. But yet it's so simple now that whenever people are suggesting that maybe there's more than one way to heaven, people are suggesting that all of the gods are actually the same God. And these are people that are high up let's use that phrase in christian circles people who you will have seen on the religious channels this week if you've looked far enough people whose books you've probably read are involved in this type of thing and it worries me because sometimes i do think are people involved for the right reasons and they're actually able to get the word of god in there somehow because i don't have an issue with that if that is the motivation because we should be taking the word of god to wherever we get the platform to do it as long as that's what the motivation is but if it's not what the motivation is, well then there's something wrong. And the fact is for us is that we cannot mix this type of thing. Bible is clear. There's one way to heaven. One way to heaven and nothing else through the name and the sacrifice and the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And the church of Pergamum were guilty of mixing it up with other practices and religions. This is a compromise and should never happen in the church. Bear in mind, what was the commendation? These guys never renounced their faith in jesus don't miss the point they never renounced their faith in jesus even though they were being persecuted to the highest level some were losing their lives never renounced their faith but yet had somehow compromised in this idea of sexual immorality had somehow compromised in this idea of not being worried about offending their brothers and sisters so that people could be enticed to sin not being if uh getting rid of the idea of knowledge being power and all of these things that were prevalent of the day and mixing up religion with other things. Are, is the church guilty of that today? I su suggest that it is. The, the relevance in these seven chapters for today, or these seven letters for today, is unbelievable and not stuff that we should ever, ever ignore. Christians today may be indifferent to lots of things, different to adultery fornication some even involved in it with the privacy of late night tv the internet everything is so easy accessible nowadays what is going on 
I know people can make mistakes and they can ask for forgiveness and get up and shake themselves down, but what is actually going on in people's lives? Because as a church, we are so guilty at looking at the external. We really, really are. And I'm, and I'm talking to myself here, I'm talking to everybody in here. It's amazing how we think of an external thing. It's amazing if we see something that where our thought goes immediately. But what about all of the stuff that actually we don't see? What about all of the stuff in our own lives that is hidden? Because none of us are perfect. What about the thoughts that goes on in our hearts? What about the jealousy? What about the envy? What about the rage? What about the anger? What about the unforgiveness? What about all those things that we never really talk about? What about the things that we're guilty of that is actually what Jesus and other writers are talking about? Whereas we dress it up as something that is obviously seen. And we're every last one of us in this room right now, including myself, we are guilty of it whenever we see something. We have a reaction sometimes. But it's what's going on right here. This is where we need to start. Remember whenever we're teaching on the Sermon on the Mount, we start at that place of brokenness, poor in spirit before God, because theirs is the kingdom of heaven. That's where we need to start recognizing that actually we will never be perfect, ever. And uh, ask God to forgive us in the first place. We're allowing our children to be taught that certain practices are acceptable today. When we should be standing up for truth. That's a tough one in this day and age. You know, I'm glad my kids are actually older now. Because it's so hard. There's so much going on. I read so much. And I know that stuff is being taught in schools. That it's hard for parents to keep up with. But as parents. As Christian parents. We need to somehow teach the truth. To our children as well. Are, do, are we doing what we can. To stop the moral decline. Or are we like the church in Pergamon, just sitting and doing nothing? If we're looking God's blessings instead of curses, we would be advised to turn from complacency and seeking the righteousness of God. Remember what the righteousness of God is? That's that complete desire to serve him in everything that we do. Because being saved by grace doesn't give us a license to sin. And it's amazing how many people in this world today think that it does. I think I talked about that as well, antinomianism, where people feel that they can come to God and then live however they like. It's not in the Bible I see. So just finally, just to tidy this up, verse 16 says, Repent therefore otherwise. I will soon come to you and will fight against them and the sword of my mouth. You know, we will, sa we will stand before God and explain our actions and our inactions and give an account of our lives. We need to repent of any sin that may be present there. And what does Jesus say? He says, whoever has ears, let them hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To the one who is victorious, I will give some of the hidden manna. I will also give that person a white stone with a new written name on it. A new name written on it. Known only to the one who receives it. The manna. If we look at the Old Testament reality, what did the manna do for the children of Israel for 40 years? It sustained them. It was their sustenance. It is what kept them alive and kept them going. And God will sustain us. To the one who is victorious, God will sustain us whilst we are here. Until we eat of the bread of life which is in heaven. And the white stone. I did a wee bit of research around the white stone yesterday. I'm sure, I don't know, maybe some people in the room has researched this white stone with a name on it. There's, ver there's loads of different potential explanations for it. I'm not going to get into all those this morning. That's a whole other sermon. But the one that seems most likely is that the white stone in this context is probably a token that can be used to gain entry into a banquet. And whether that's the explanation for it or not, you know what? There's lots of questions. I can't wait to get to heaven to ask some of the theological questions that I have that, you know, for example, whenever Jesus got down in front of the adulterous woman and he drew in the sand, I cannot wait to find out what it was he was writing in the sand, genuinely. There's lots of stuff I really want to know. I want to know who Paul's talking about when he said that this, I know a man who was called up into the third heaven. I'm interested to know if that was Paul himself and he was just being, you know, not being proud about it and sort of talking about it in terms of somebody else. There's loads of questions. I'm sure you've got them too. I want to know about actually what this stone is. 
doesn't really matter really it doesn't change my life today whether i know exactly what jesus was, 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 was meaning here but the point that i want to leave with you today is that possibly it's in the context of a token that we will have as our entrance into the banquet the marriage supper of the lamb in heaven so that we can be with jesus christ for eternity and we will be we all know that and when you repent and come to christ you have a new name which is written in the lamb's book of life you know, I hope that you're getting something out of these churches as we go forward over the next few months. Um, and hopefully, hopefully we can see what it is that is happening in this world today, genuinely, so that we can take a grasp the nettle and work out what it is that we're actually genuinely here for. And something keeps coming to me at the minute is that my life is not about me. And I know that we know that, but it the more i pray and the more i seek god the more i feel that god's saying you're only here for 70 80 90 whatever years it happens to be there's a reason why you're here and it's not all of the things that seem obvious yes we have tasks that we must maintain and do absolutely god gives us responsibilities but genuinely trying to get this point across it's not about what we think it is and maybe maybe it's just me that's being challenged about. Maybe I'm thinking wrongly about. Maybe I've started. Maybe I was thinking wrongly in the first place. That's the point. Maybe you already think like this. But there's been a real challenge for me, and where I am is to recognise that actually it doesn't matter about comfort. It doesn't matter about what it is that we go through. It doesn't matter. Those things are for a reason, and they're for producing in us what we need to be in order for us to actually do. And it's so, every last one of us will probably pray this week about God showing him as well for us in our lives. And I'm suggesting that maybe we need to recognize that God's will for our life is for us just to lay our lives down on the altar and for us to actually say, my life is not about me. My life is not about the comfort that I might receive from something. And yes, scripture tells us that of course we bring our concerns and our petitions before God. But it's the recognition and the mindset that actually, yes, that's okay. But the mindset should be that we're serving God regardless. And if God decides to take us home tomorrow or in another 50 years time, then why we need to serve God regardless in the in-between time. And if God takes us, then he's, he's potentially healed us anyway, if that makes sense. And very often we pray for healing for people and God's healing maybe just to take them home. And I'm not, listen, I know what it's, I know, I understand that we need to pray for people. That is a scriptural concept and a thing. The point that I'm trying to say here is that we need to get our head and our minds to the place where actually we recognize what it is that's going on in our lives and what should be going on in our lives. And in this day and age that we live in, how best can we impact the world? And that's the prayer that I have for me at the minute. And I hope that somehow I can push that on to you guys a little bit. As God, show me exactly. It doesn't mean I sit and do nothing every day. But show me how best I can impact this world with the gifts and the talents that you have given me. And each and every one of us should be saying, yes, God, we're going to get up every day. We're going to serve you every day. We're going to do what the word of God says every day. But God, how best can I impact this world with the gifts that you have given me? Yeah. And let's, let's turn the world upside down. Jesus turned the world upside down with 12 guys 2,000 years ago who be, potentially have become 500 million evangelical Christians today, maybe more. Look, let me pray before we finish. Heavenly Father, Lord, I just thank you for your word. Lord, I thank you what your word says. Lord, there is not a dot or a cross T or a comma or anything. Lord, it shouldn't be there. And Lord, it frustrates me whenever people try to tear holes in scripture, but they're never, ever going to be able to manage it. It frustrates me whenever Christians have debates and conversations who haven't potentially even read the Bible for themselves. And Lord, I just pray, Lord, that you will give us such an enthusiasm for the word of God and such an enthusiasm and a hunger for the spirit of God that we recognize when those two things combine, Lord, that that right there is dunamis, dynamite. Lord, that that right there is what will change this world, Lord God. And all we have to be is worthy vessels of your word and your spirit, Lord God. 
and that whenever we carry your word and spirit to the world that the Holy Spirit knew, God will do everything else. We just have to be worthy vessels and we just have to take you to the world. Lord, give us the opportunities to serve you each and every day and help us to recognize the gifts and the talents that you've given us, Lord God, so that we can put them to the use that you have given them to us for. Lord, help us, Lord, to live each day as if it was our last. Lord, help us, Lord, to live each day, Lord, forgetting what has went before, Lord, and asking forgiveness for the things that we've done wrong, but each and every day to be motivated, Lord, by serving you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.